following announcement has been paid for by the WZWA Network. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, you're looking at Tough Time, one half of disorderly conduct in the Texas hangman. You're watching WZWA Network. Hi, everybody. This is former WWE superstar Al Snow. And TWN is Sean Oliver. My name is Eugene. And you are watching the Insider's Edge podcast. Now get on the train. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Insider's Edge podcast here on the WZWA Network in conjunction with Blue Wire Hustle. I am your host with the most on the West Coast, California in Fury. I'm sure you're all very sick and tired of hearing me say the same introduction every week, but I got to do it, man. That's that's how I do it. And if you don't like it, you know where you can stick it. Um, but here today, you know, look, I've had a rough week. I've had a real rough week. I've had a few people uh, not show up for scheduled interviews. Uh, being from Perth, Western Australia, it's difficult because I've got to be up very late at night for some of these. But so, so things have been rough, but I figured, you know what? Let's not worry about things being rough. Let's worry about things getting tough. Because right here, right now, I have a third of the Texas Hangman and one half of Disorderly Conduct, one of the most underrated tag teams in WCW history. He is the one and only Tough Tom. Tom, how are you, my friend? Good, Carl. How are we doing? Yeah, I'm great, bro. I, I got another bottle of red wine for tonight, so uh, I'm uh, I'm in a good mood. No bathroom, uh, no bathroom break, so, bro. <laughs> no, not this time, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it seems to happen when I drink beer. Uh, so I, I've noticed when I when I drink red wine, I it, I don't seem to need the toilet breaks very often. But uh, anyway, uh, enough about me and 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 my toilet breaks. Tough Tom, very excited to talk to you here on the show. And the first question I always ask everybody on the show is: Is how did you become a wrestling fan when you were a young man? Oh boy, let's see. Um, of course, I, I don't know if you guys know, but I'm from the Midwest. Uh, about 60 miles north of Milwaukee. So obviously Vern Gagne, his territory is just over the state line. So every Sunday morning after we got home from church, we put on old Vern Gagne for an hour, WW, uh, AWA wrestling. And I guess that's sort of where it started for me, but I really didn't turn on until cable came along. And then all of a sudden we got the Superstation TBS, and then I got uh, got to see, I guess, nationwide stars is how I seen it, and uh, that was the NWA, that was on TBS, Ted Turner, and uh, that's when I really started to get the uh, the itch. Yep. Fair enough. Uh, I guess, you know, a, a lot of, uh, you know, people that got into the wrestling business at one stage, there was something else that they were into. Did you do any other types of sport in school or anything like that? I played uh, football in high school. Uh, nothing that was ever going to get me anywhere or take me to college or anything. Just, uh, just because I was an athlete, you know? Uh, yeah. So that was about it. Yep. Cool. Um, so at what point, do you start to think to yourself, okay, this is something that I really want to do. And how do you go from being a fan to, okay, this is what I want to do. How do I break in? How did you figure out how to get yourself broken into the business? Uh, I don't know if it's a funny story, but I, uh, I, I bartended. All right. So I was uh, working at a bar, a place called TD's Beach Club here in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And uh, Monday nights at that time, they were doing Bobby Heenan and uh, Gorilla Monsoon was doing primetime. Okay. It was on a Monday night here. Okay. So I always turned the jukebox off and everything. And we turned on primetime and everybody that came in was a wrestling fan, basically. Right. So weeks later, after we do this for a while, one of the customers comes in and brings me a ad from the Milwaukee Sentinel which is the biggest town around, around me. And it said pro wrestling camp now open. Okay. Right. So what happens is uh, uh, another 
uh, one of the bartenders puts this on our tip jar. All right. And, and my nickname, my real name is Tom Benninghouse. So everybody calls me Benny. All right. So it said pennies for Benny help send them to wrestling camp. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, only in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. But anyway, <laughs> after a couple months of that, it turns into bucks for Benny help send them to wrestling camp. All right. So also now there's a pile of cash here and these people are expecting me to do something with it. All right. So one night uh, I'm bartending, I get done bartending. I'm sitting on the other side of the bar and I'm having some cocktails and, and, and enjoying myself. And I'm staring at this jar with money in it, you know, that says bucks for Ben and help send him to wrestling camp. And uh, I don't know, I had a, you know, a few in me and uh, sure enough that night, one thirty, I get home from the bar. I call this number. And the guy's like, you can tell he just woke up, right? He just wakes up, like, hello, you know. I go, hey, man, I'm ready for camp, you know. I'm jacked at this point. I'm just, just half drunk, gassed up. I'm going, all right, I'm ready, you know. Oh, dude, call me back in the morning, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Bit too keen. That's man. really how it started. I got in touch with uh, uh, the guy unannounced to me on the other side of the, uh, the phone that night was Chris Curtis, Chris Curtis and Tom Stone, Tom Rocky Stone. I'm sure you're talking to us three guys. You heard his name quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he says, yeah, come on down. So we come on down. And, of course, the first time they literally, literally beat the shit out of you. <laughs> Just to see if you're going to come back, you know. Yeah, of course. So that's really, that's where it started. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, so, uh, how did the camp go, and uh, you know, how long was it uh, uh, through your training? Uh, was it until you finally were, I guess, ready for your first match? I broke in in um, late '88. Um, of course, it's the same camp that Mike and Frank went through. Um, uh, my first match was November 3rd, 1989. So I would say we trained for about a year. Right. Okay, cool. Yeah. That's, um, a good amount of training to get behind you. You know, uh, I've had so many guys on the show that say, yeah, I, um, I did one training and then all of a sudden I was thrown in the ring. So, uh, <laughs> a, a bit more preparation for you. Um, so, uh, again, I don't know if Mike spoke to you about this very much, but when I did research uh, on him for his interview, I had a very hard time because a lot of yeah, there's a lot of stuff out on the internet that's mixed up, just wrong, just everything wrong. And um, through the research that I'd done, I'd found that someone had mixed you and Mike up. So they said everything that you had done is actually what Mike had done and everything you had done as well. It was, it was just, it was a complete mix up. So I went through all those websites and contacted them and got them to fix it. So, um, but again, research was very difficult for me. Your Wikipedia says you broke in in 1986. You're telling me 1988. So I will fix that after this interview. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, how was that first match? And, you know, how long was it after that? that you found yourself in the AWA? Actually, let's, let's just take a step back. Because, sure. Uh, during training, <laughs> uh, Tom Stone and Chris Curtis, they're training us. And all of a sudden, uh, one day, two big bohemists walk in the door. And sure enough, it's Mike and Frank. <laughs> they're, just, they're just starting to get their push in AWA. Okay. You know, they, they had a good push in AWA. So uh, they decide they want to work out with the newbies and bro literally for 45 minutes pounded us into the ground. It was like, <laughs> it was like a 45 minute enhancement match. <laughs> uh, just <laughs> You want to talk about paying your dues? Uh, not, you know, all of us guys from Milwaukee, I think we work a little snug because we like to, you know, when I broke in, it was, it was real, bro. You know what I mean? I mean, it was, it was a lot of kayfabe and, 
you just work a little snugger. So you made sure there were no misses, you know what I mean? And, and it, if a bloody nose or something becomes out of it, that's just, you know, that's part of the business. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, a 45 minute enhancement match is a rarity. Uh, they're, oh, supposed to, they're supposed to only go about two minutes, but uh... <laughs> oh, I could have puked after that. Let me tell you, <laughs> but it was a good learning experience. You know what I mean? And, and like I say, it never hurted you, but yeah. I mean, ran you around and bumped the hell out of you, you know, and, and uh, it was a good experience. Yeah, and 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 when they do that, they're they they're trying to get you to prove that you belong, right? And, and absolutely, that's absolutely. that's kind of like the beauty of what the business was like back then was you you really you had to prove yourself. You didn't just walk in and pay your fee and okay, now you're training, and then in three months you're going to be a weekend warrior wrestling on shows like people do these days. And what I actually did as well, all of a sudden I was uh, wrestling after two months of training. Uh, <laughs> but oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> actually we're, we're pretty well uh, considering, yeah, yeah. but um, so, I mean, you grew up watching the AWA. So how does the opportunity come about, you know, as time wears on where you, where you actually get to work there? Okay. Uh, uh, the way I recall this going is Tom Stone had some hookups with Vern. Why or how? I don't know. You know, that was before me. And he also had ties with WWF at that time. And I think him and Terry Garvin traveled up and down the roads a little bit together. So that's how that hookup came. So Stone, we have, he also ran you know it was like a little territory throughout the midwest you know mostly milwaukee kenosha stuff like that so my first match was november 3rd 1989 it was at franklin high school uh it was against uh a real good friend of mine god bless his soul uh trevor heartbreaker adonis and uh Mike, some, I can't remember, oh, Mike Brom, and they were the rock, you know, they were like a rock and roll express kind of deal, you know. Right. So we're back, we talk about the finish, and basically the rest of it, we pretty much go out there and do, you know, I mean, back then, you, you called a lot of stuff in the ring, you know, you had the major stuff set up, but that was, you know, like the finish, but that was, so... Trevor looks at me before the match. He goes, oh, are you ready, brother? You know, and I looked at him. I go, oh, I'm going to try, brother. He goes, the hell you're going to try. <laughs> We're going to get this. <laughs> I said, all right, all right. So we go, I, you know, we go out to the ring and uh, me and Trevor happen to lock up. He takes me back in the corner. And I just looked at him. I go, dude, I am lost. I have no, <laughs> idea. I have no idea where this match is going. <laughs> so being the consummate professional that he was, he walked me through it and we made it through. And uh, <laughs> ever since then, that was always a joke. Well, I'll try, brother. You know what I mean? And uh, <laughs> we got through it. It was pretty good. Uh, I come from a city of approximately 50,000. So, and I was a bartender. So I, I knew a lot of people. So they took a bus actually from Sheboygan here down to Franklin in Milwaukee. And so, I mean, I had a lot of people there and, you know, they were just popping because I was one of their hometown boys. You know what I mean? They weren't <laughs> popping because it was fabulous or anything. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that was my first match, Franklin High School, 1989. <laughs> awesome, man. Awesome. Um, so, yeah, you, you, you mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, Tom had his connections uh, with AWA and also WWF. I would noticed uh, 14th of... Um, May 1990. Uh, I, I believe this is the first time you you work uh, in the WWF on Wrestling Challenge with uh, Tim Jurgen taking on the Rockers. Is that correct? I do believe that is correct. Yeah. Uh, keep in mind, before that though, we Stone sort of brought us into AWA first, right? You know, because I mean, even back then, there was starting to become a difference from AWA to at that time, WWF. Right. So uh, we went and started doing Vern stuff and uh, as enhancement talent, of course. I mean, that's mostly besides maybe us three guys, a couple other guys, but 
enhancement talent is what Milwaukee was known for. You know what I mean? It, because that's how we were trained. Right. You know, shut your mouth, shut your mouth, do what they tell you, go get your payday. And, you know, so we never really got taught to get put over, but anyway, um, we do AWA. Now Stone thinks we're ready to go do WWF. Uh, we go do WWF. And I do believe that was that was my first match. Yeah, and I was uh, nervous, yeah, probably. I was yeah, nervous. Man. I, I believe it's a, it might be a set of tapings that's doing two weeks at a time because uh, you also team with Tom Stone working with the Heart Foundation. Um, so yeah, I do believe that's correct, too. Uh, so, I mean, geez, it's, uh, you know, right out of the gate there, you, 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 you're working against, you know, two of the, the top teams there in the WWF. Uh, do you have any stories of working with those guys? Uh, as I recall, uh, man, Nightheart was, you know, those guys were, you know, like I say, it was, it was supposed to be believed, you know what? So they were, they were snug guys. Uh, Brett, consummate professional. I mean, as long as he knew you could work. And, and I'll tell you, he's – the minute you lock up with him, he'll be able to tell if you can work or not, right? right so yeah. even, you know, you got to throw a couple punches back and stay alive, you know what I mean? But that was that was really all the matches consisted of, you know. We were there to get them guys over, and, and that, that was our job. So that's what we did. Yeah, cool, man. Yeah, I've had a few guys on the show that – uh yeah, like Dwayne Gill and uh, Barry Horowitz, and we spoke to them, you know, at length. Uh, uh, you know what it's like as an enhancement talent. You know, uh, how were you treated as an enhancement talent in the WWF during those times? Well, I think you know, as anything in life, you know, there's there's guys that understand uh, what your job is, or. Yeah. And there's pricks, you know what I mean? I mean, <laughs> in, in every, you know, so a couple of the guys were pricks, a couple of guys were cool. You know, they, a lot of the guys back then, I mean, this thing was just taken off. I mean, really taken off for Vince, you know what I mean? So they knew what they had to do to get themselves over. And sometimes it was at our expense, you know what I mean? And, and I guess I get that, you know, so I don't, it was it was a fabulous experience. Uh, I, I do have a, a, fu a funny story from uh, WWF. We go and we're doing some, uh, uh, of course, enhancement matches, and uh, you go to a board and you see who you're up against. And all of a sudden, I walk up to the board and it says Legion of Doom against Tom Bennett and Frankie DeFalco. <laughs> and I'm going, oh shit, man! I'm I'm going to get it handed to me tonight. You know what I mean? So uh, I get with Frankie. Frankie also comes from the Milwaukee area. You know, I'm a Milwaukee boy. So Frankie comes over. He goes, oh, man. He goes, I'm nervous. I'm scared. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Relax. All right. So we go over and we have a word or two with uh, Hawk and Animal. And uh, basically the way the match go back then they were doing 45 second matches, bro. I mean, yeah. you know, a match. You know what I mean? They slid in, they took care of business. And so Frank's deal is the only thing he has to do, get grabbed and thrown over the top rope. Right. All right. So I'm going for the ride, right? I know I'm going for the ride. <laughs> but you know, I'm I'm nervous about it. That was a tough bump. That was that, that was a nerve-wracking bump. So we get out there. I was like, what a rush, you know, here these guys come. I mean, that's intimidating as hell, to be honest. <laughs> so anyway, they slide in, boom, boom, boom. They go to throw Frank over the top rope. He sandbags, doesn't oh, no. get over the top rope. Finally, they, you know, he's down on the mat. They kick him out. They come over to me. They bump me once or twice. I think I got that big uh, shoulder deal. And then all of a sudden, boom, they hoist me. They give me the deal. Everything's fine. Didn't hurt the neck or nothing. Get back. And Tony Gregory goes, you guys got to get out there again. He goes, Frank, you fucked that up. <laughs> so also I said, this is the only time I've ever said no in wrestling. And I said, Tony, with all due respect, it was Tony Gurria. I said, Tony, with all due respect, I said, I just made it through that ride. I said, I'm not taking it again tonight. And all of a sudden, Tony says, oh, okay, brother, I, I get you. And he went and got a different guy and had to go out there. And 
Oh, really? Yeah, man. I, it was, it was uh, Frank sandbagging, just getting thrown over the top rope. How, how crazy is that? <laughs> so it, that that match didn't end up airing after you took the the move and everything. They ended up going with another guy. Correct. <laughs> Damn, all that for nothing. Yeah, all that for nothing, right? <laughs> man, because like I, I remember when I was a, a teenager, I uh, I I bought the road warriors uh wwf dvd and you know there's a whole disc of matches in the first like 10 matches on there are just these squash matches in front of the the small crowd and they just come in like a house of fire and i'm like i would not like to be on the other end of that because it looked very very rough uh <laughs> well, i heard stories about them you know when they when they broke in with Vern and they didn't smarten them up much you know so they were i mean real snug you know <laughs> and uh, at least by this time they were, you know, I mean, my God, they were superstars already. You know what I mean? They, they knew what they were doing and uh, they took care of us. Like I said, it was, it was just a snugger business back then. That's all. Yeah. Um, so another tag team I wanted to ask about that you work with uh, uh, the 26th of June, 1990, your tag team partner is Kent Carlson and you take on the Bushwhackers. Uh, I haven't had anyone talk about the Bushwhackers on the show yet. So have you got any uh, memories of that? Well, I, now that you bring up Ken Carlson, can we jump back a fuzz? Sure, go for it. All right, so so when I go to training camp, Kent Carlson happens to be a long, long friend of mine, lifelong. Right. Okay. So I ain't going into wrestling myself. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Kent, I say, hey, dude, we're going to go do this. <laughs> so he actually breaks in with me. And we form a team called the James Gang, all right? We were cowboy guys. All right. All right. So uh, Stone, like Tom Stone, starts running a little federation, IAW, you know, like I said, doing a little around the Midwest. And me and Kent become the tag team champions. Well, during this time, Stone actually gets a, a... TV deal on a TV station called uh, uh, Channel 43 in Waukesha or something, right? It's just a, a public access thing. Right. <laughs> so that's where me and Kent really got used to, uh, you know, cameras, looking for the camera, doing, you know, because if it's done right, you know where the camera, where the hard camera is all the time, right? Yeah. So that's really where we got our first taste of, of getting over and we became the uh, IAW tag team champions. Right. So then after that, uh, Kent gets married, starts a family. I go on my own. At that time, probably like a lot of the boys, I didn't have money for new gear and stuff. So I just became Blackjack Bennett. Yeah. And if you notice in WWE and that I'm wrestling under the name Tom Bennett. Okay. So yeah. I become Blackjack Bennett and start working the, the indie areas around here. And then Mike comes into the story, and that's where I become a Texas hang. Right. Cool, bro. Um <laughs> So uh, did, did Kent even really want to get into the business or did you just drag him along? <laughs> I think uh, I, I think it was a drag along. Thing <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not that he didn't like it, but uh, uh, <laughs> he didn't totally buy into it. You know, you know, I mean, another, for instance, when we're training in, in Milwaukee, uh, you know, we're standing there. I remember talking with stone and he's trying to teach us psychology and going through stuff, just sitting around in the ring and not bumping. And he goes, you know, guys, now we just gave this guy 1500 bucks, right? He goes, you know, guys, you got to sort of look at this as being on a softball team. He says, you just go and do your thing. And then you're done. You know, he goes, I'm going I thought this was going to be a career, you know what I mean? And uh, I found out after the Franklin payday of 15 bucks <laughs> that I, uh, you know, I mean, I had more in driving there and, and, you know, it, my first couple matches costed me money, you know what I mean? <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> So that's really, um, 
how it started for me way, you know, this was probably like 90, 91, 92. And at that's at the same time, we're going to do TVs for enhancement talent. Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, back to my question about the bushwhackers. Uh, you remember mm-hmm. working with them? I do. Yeah. Uh, easy day off. Uh, <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. Yeah. I mean, just uh, great guys. You know, they were uh, friendly guys. You know what I mean? They were, they were, they were nice. I, I went to work them years later after I actually knew what the heck I was doing and uh, had some good matches with those guys. That's cool, man. Um, so I, I, I need to bring up some of these other matches you had before I start moving on to uh, other things. Uh, 19th of the 9th, uh, nineteen ninety. From my recollection, not recollection, that's not the word. Uh, from my research, your first singles match is against Earthquake. Is that true? I believe that's also true, yeah. All right, I'm, I'm not doing too bad tonight. It was, uh, it was pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, once again, I mean, you, you know, with a guy that size, you know, you're talking, what, I, don't, I don't know if you have the times there, but it couldn't have went more than two minutes. You know yeah, most I mean? of these matches are, are between, I think, uh, two and five minutes, uh, but still. Uh, you know, these are some these are some great names to be working with uh, so early in your career. I mean, uh, you're broken in in '88, and you know by '90 you're you're working on WWF TV. And tenth uh, of the tenth, you're against the Big Boss Man. Thirtieth of the tenth, against Jake the Snake Roberts. Uh, what did you enjoy most about the, you know some of these matches? And you know, do you have any Jake stories? Oh man, I, I was still very. I was green yet, you know what I mean, as far as, as 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 how the business works and how the boys were. I mean, the real boys, you know what I mean? Yeah. We had little locker rooms here in the, you know, but I mean, the boys were ribbers, right? I mean, especially at that time, a lot of them were ribbon. So me being the green guy that I am, <laughs> I love to Jake. I said, bro, he goes, I said, I will do anything, anything you want, please. Don't put the snake on me. <laughs> <laughs> well, needless to say, me and that snake were damn near kissing at the end of the deal. I mean, he's got it up in my face. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, I learned, you know, even at that point, just maybe shut your mouth a little more. You know what I mean? And uh, so, I don't know, a few months after <clears throat> Jake, I actually opened a thing of cereal and there me and Jake are on one of those little reflector cards and the snake is like right. inches, inches <laughs> from my face. And I, I just remember just uh, hating that, man. It was, it was, I'm not a big snake guy, you know? So <laughs> No, of course. Um, you probably would have been better off telling him that you love snakes. And yeah, snake absolutely. In my face. And then he probably wouldn't have done it. Huh? Correct. <laughs> Bit of reverse psychology there. Um, yep. So another another match I had to bring up because you know this is you're, you're battling Bret Hart for the Intercontinental Championship on the eighth of the fourth ninety two. Uh, look, you're an enhancement guy still at this stage, but you're wrestling for the Intercontinental Championship. For you, early stage of your career, still four years in, that must have been quite a you know a feather in the cap to say I worked Bret Hart singles match for the IC title. Well, you know, like I say, Brett was one of those guys that, uh, man, a consummate professional uh, in and out of the ring. And he actually let me work a little bit because let's face it, you know, if you're just bumping this kid around, doesn't look like you beat anybody anyway, right? That's it, yep. So uh, as I recall that match, he actually let me work and, and, and I got some stuff in. Of course, he's calling it right out there. He's, he's, he's you know, a, a guy that came in that era, you know, of calling it out there. Of course, I'm uh, going to take the sharpshooter. So that was actually pretty enjoyable for me, to be honest with you, because he actually let me work. You know what I mean? It, it wasn't a, a up until then I was, you know, doing two or three minute matches. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not that this one went much longer, but, uh, you know, I, I mean, Gracie let me hit him, you know. <laughs> well, that's a bonus. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and before I start moving on into some Texas hangman territory, I had to bring this match up as well. 
uh, again, a friend of the show that we, we we've interviewed Dwayne Gill, um, uh, one of the more, most famous enhancement talents. Well, he, he, he's proud of calling himself a jobber, um, but you team with him. Yeah. And he, and you guys, you team up against Coco B. Wen, Owen Hart. I have to bring it up because every time there's a chance for me to bring up Owen Hart, I'm going to bring up Owen Hart because i uh, massive fan and everyone always seems to have some sort of story with Owen. Do you have any Owen stories at all or, or memories of this matchup? I do remember the match uh, here again. I believe me and Dwayne got to work a bit. Uh, you have to remember when, when you're enhancement talent and, and you're a top guy, even though you're in the same locker room, it's, it's, it's just, it's, you know, you have your clicks, you know what I mean? Right. The enhancement talent pretty much stayed over here. Right. Okay. And the top <laughs> guys pretty much stayed over there. You met in the middle to talk a little bit about your match and the finish and, and, and you know, Right. So I really okay. have no stories about Owen. Uh, That's okay. Uh, yeah, I, I I remember it was a good match though. Yeah, that's cool, man. Yeah, no, I completely understand. Uh, I I do re- recall some guys on the show saying, yeah, like essentially we all just kind of sat in catering, just us all working or all, all sitting there waiting to see if we're all going to be on the show or not. Some of them might not be picked. Yeah. Some maybe. Um, right. So. You've been doing this now for some time. Um, did you ever feel to yourself, okay, like I've been seen on television for all this time as a guy that loses all of my matches. Were you concerned once the WWF thing was going to be done with that it will be difficult to shake that enhancement talent label and try and be seen as more of a, a competitive you know, guy in the industry? Well, you know, like I say, Tom Stone, great guy. Uh, uh, just never taught us to protect a gimmick or 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 get yourself over. You know what I mean? I mean, he, bottom line is Tom Stone was really there for the money. God bless. He took me along. You know what I mean? I mean, uh, you know, but the only time we had a chance to try and get ourselves over was on the indie scene. You know what I mean? Okay. And yeah. So now, you know, on the indie scene at this time, I'm doing blackjack Bennett. Well, I'm Tom Bennett on TV, you know, and, and it just, uh, yeah, we weren't taught to get over that, plain and simple. You know, if, if that's probably one thing I regret about my training, you know, by not going to a Eddie Sharkey or, or a, a, a bigger name guy, that knew what getting over was and, and, and how to protect your gimmick or, 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 you know, because that's what you're selling, right? I mean, you're selling yourself and, and, and we just never got taught how to really protect that. Right. Interesting. Interesting. I, I like the perspective. That's great. Um, so I know you, you do a bit of stuff in Windy City Wrestling. Is this yeah. around the time where you've been asked to become a Texas hangman? That actually is, uh, uh, let's see. Yeah. Me and Mike go in for Sam Becerro, Windy City Wrestling. And that was really my first exposure as a Texas hangman. I mean, besides a couple little spot shows here in, in, in the Malibu of the Midwest. So, um, that's when. I really start learning about protecting a gimmick and protecting your persona and, and, and ways to sell and not to sell and who to sell for and who not to sell for. And you know what I mean? So that's really where I honed taking care of a gimmick, you know, before it was, you know, I didn't have a gimmick. I was Tom Bennett, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah, that's where I really, uh, and, and, and don't get me wrong. It wasn't me. Mike is the one that really took me under his wing and, and, you know, uh, 
produced the wrestler that I became really, you know, I mean, I, I, I did the work and I, I, I'm pretty athletic, but he, you know, without Mike, you know, you probably never would have heard of, of tough Tom, you know, to be honest with you, because if it wouldn't have been for him uh, and a couple other guys, uh, mainly Mike, you know, Mike, Terry Taylor, uh, uh, Jimmy Hart, you know, those guys are who I really owe thanks to them three guys, because they're really the ones that got me to the level that, that, that I got to. That's cool, man. Um, so yeah, I mean, I mean, speaking of the hangman, speaking of Mike, do you remember the first conversation that you two had where he was like, look, Paul is no longer going to be doing the hangman thing. I would like to ask you to take his spot. Uh, do you have memories of that conversation? I, I don't know if I have memories of the first conversation because to be honest with you, I think there were many. Mike okay. was pretty protective of, of his hangman thing. And uh, I think he really would have to trust somebody that he's asking to be a hangman. You know what I mean? So uh, like I said, without Mike Moran, I, I, I wouldn't have got as far as I did. Um, so the first conversation, I really don't remember. I remember telling him, telling me, Hey man, you got to bulk up. You got you know, you to get heavier. You <laughs> got to look alike. You know what I mean? Right, and, yeah. and that's really how that started was, dude, we got to, you know, you got to be able to do switching and stuff when you're, when you're wearing a hood and, you know, to get some real heat and, you know, stuff like that. So that's really where those conversations went is bulking okay. up and, and learning the, you know, the double things that we wanted to do together. Some of the things that, that uh, Frank and Mike did together, you know, so. Awesome, bro. Um, So when you, when you finally do become a Texas hangman, you know, how long is it into the run that you're starting to feel really comfortable with it? I mean, you've never worn a mask before and now you're wearing a mask. Uh, you know, how long did you feel like, okay, like now I, now I'm starting to really dig this whole hangman thing and, and wearing the mask and, and feel, just feel comfortable doing this. Well, first of all, let me just say, I dug it from the beginning. All right. But cool, uh, cool. yeah, actually being comfortable and feeling like a true hangman. Yeah. I don't know. I would say after Sam DeCero, you know, I mean, we became his tag team champions. Uh, that's another thing, you know, you, I, I hate to say it, but you sort of got to learn how to be a champion. You know what I mean? I mean, and conduct, uh, conduct yourself as, as a champion. Yeah. Um, you got to remember when we were, you know, riding around, going to shows and stuff, boy, we'd stop three blocks before, put our hoods on, we'd roll yeah. in with our hoods on the whole deal. You know what I mean? We wanted to protect that people didn't know who we were. I think, yeah. and I think all my guys do that, you know? because it was still supposedly a shoot, you know, and, and we wanted to protect all that, you know, we were part of the brotherhood and we wanted to protect that. So yeah, That's after cool. Sam DeCero, I was starting to, you know, and then all of a sudden we started traveling a bit. And so I was pretty comfortable by that time. Awesome, bro. Um, so I got to bring up Puerto Rico. Uh, you guys end up going to Puerto Rico. Again, my research is very difficult to find out the precise time that you guys were, were there together, you know, whether it was him and Bull or it was him. I would and say him. that was probably 95, 96. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I know that you guys really do well in Puerto Rico. Uh, you know, one of the top tag teams there, former uh, World Wrestling Council tag team champions. Please just tell me a little bit about your life in Puerto Rico, the journey that you guys had there as the Texas Heyman. Well, that was really probably... Uh... It was the first time I really traveled. I mean, you know, really traveled. Uh, so Mike says, hey, you want to go to Puerto Rico? I said, sure, man, I'm up for it. So we go to Puerto Rico. Um, long history of the Texas hangman there, you know, from Christ, I think 90, probably 1991. Uh, Mike and, and Frank dominated over there, to be honest with you. They, I mean, they were, you know, that gimmick was great for over there. You know what I mean? I mean, they were hanging invader and, and and carlos and, and yeah you know. <laughs> so i had some pretty big shoes to fill if you ask me in that territory uh, i think we pulled it off we became tag team champions 
uh, rough, you know, uh, very rough. The fans, boy, if they bought into it, they were rough. <laughs> uh, I remember one time we're down there with Buddy Landell is in and we're, we're the top heel team and he's a top heel. And he got that crowd so incensed, they were starting to try to break down the locker room door. Uh, cops got us out the other side, got us in our cars and got us out of there. But I mean, that's, that's how incensed Puerto Rican fans can become, especially when you're beating their hero up. You know what I mean? Uh, throwing spark plugs at you, uh, cups of piss, you know, I mean, <laughs> right. or like, whatever, you know, <laughs> uh, so that was a, a, a big learning experience for me also. And, uh, um, yeah, it was, it was good. You know what I mean? You didn't go to the building till nine o'clock at night. You uh, got to lay around in the sun all day, go work out and, and go wrestle, you know? So a uh, uh, lot of memories, a uh, lot of hard work. Absolutely. I mean, it's Puerto Rico and, you know, there's a lot of beautiful women in Puerto Rico, so that, that can't hurt either. Uh. <laughs> Quick story. So I, uh, Later on, I go down with my wife as Blackjack Bennett. My wife is blonde and blue eyes. They don't see that much there. Oh, dear. So, yeah, she was like a goddess down there, bro. I'm All telling right. you, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes. They just don't see it. They don't see brown hair, brown eyes, you know. So uh, that's another story. But anyway, so that, that was, you know, uh, <laughs> I've been to Puerto Rico a number of times, and, and, and each time it's been pretty good to me. That's awesome, bro. Um, how did how did you feel Bull uh, felt about you becoming a hangman? Did you ever have any conversations with him? Uh, not in depth conversations. Um, uh, I think you know. I think there was there's a little resentment, probably uh, not my doing, uh, just because of the spot I took but I don't think you can really blame me for taking that spot. You know what I mean? I mean, it, it ain't like, it ain't like, you know, uh, uh, a dude honing in on your girlfriend and stealing her. You know what I mean? I mean, it was, I was asked and I just accepted, you know what I mean? So it ain't like I started the animosity between them two that made a break up so I could take that spot. Of course. So, yeah. I mean, if, if you know, I, I talk with Bull, I have talked with Bull since then. And I, I, I don't know. I think we're fine. You know, I, I don't think it was that big of a deal. He was doing his own thing by then. He was doing, you know, bull pain and doing his uh, so, Southern thing, you know. So I, I don't think he really had a problem with it. He might have some regrets as maybe how far we got or that it, that could have been him or, or whatever. And I don't know that for a fact, but a guy would think that maybe a little bit. Yeah. Um, so what led to you and Mike leaving Puerto Rico and not going back? And not going back because we went in, went in, in and out a, a few times. Um, in Puerto Rico, when they start screwing with your money, it's time to go home. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. So um, they started screwing with our money. You know what I mean? So... We said, hey, man, you, you got to get caught up with us or, or we're leaving. And that's one thing when we did, whenever we went anywhere, we always had a ticket home. You know what I mean? In case yeah. something did happen, we always had a return ticket. Yeah. Just sitting there waiting for us in case we had to get the hell out of somewhere. Yeah, so. fair enough. Um, do you still have your WWC World Tag Team title? Oh, without a question, are you kidding me? <laughs> I already say Mike's. He showed me on, on the show, but uh, I just want to make sure you still had yours. Cause yeah, oh, absolutely. I got mine hanging down in my rec room. On the that's wall. that's fantastic, bro. You, you, you guys earned it. You guys drew big money there. Uh, and you've moved on from there at this point. I'm getting to 1996. We still got a little bit of the journey to go here. Tough Tom. Uh, big Japan. Yeah. You, uh, the, the name that you, you go under is uh, Tornado Juicy? Uh, well, first of all, I, we went in for 
Yeah, that that may be correct. I, I know we went down it once or twice as a hangman, and yeah. then if I'm not mistaken, Big Japan says, "Hey, for some reason they like monsters over there." You know, I mean, like like cartoon character monsters, right? Yeah, yeah. So Mike says, "Hey, we're gonna go do Big Japan." <clears throat> he goes, "But we gotta wear masks." So he's, okay, that ain't no big deal, you know. Well. These are latex masks, like a monster. All right, like 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 Mike was uh, Gray Skull. Yeah, I was Tornado Juice, and Frank actually Frank went on that tour with us, and he was the Jester. Yeah. All right. So funny. Uh, I don't know if it's funny, but a, a real story is uh, we're flying over. It's Fifteen hour flight. I was having some cocktails, you know, free cocktails. <laughs> Get feeling very good on the plane. Uh, sleep for about an hour or two. We land. And they go, okay, we're going to Corrigan Hall. <laughs> I'm, I'm going, what? <laughs> oh, yeah, you got to work today. I'm hungover. Just had a 15-hour flight. I got a latex mask that I'm wearing with a mouth hole that's like this big, right? So, <laughs> We get over there, we're at Corrigan Hall, we do our thing. I hung over, not used to breathing in that thing. By the time the match, when the match started, the air hole on there was like that. By the time that, we <laughs> ended, the air hole was like that. <laughs> so yeah, that was, uh, that was, uh, that was doing the, the monster gimmick over, over there. That's awesome, Brian. Funny Look, story. I, funny story. Yeah, go for it. I, this wasn't the monster deal. This was when we went over as a hangman and uh, we meet Cactus Jack at, at the airport. Wow. Okay. Oh. So he has, I mean, because over there they, they want gimmicks. They want shirts. They want, you know, yeah. he's got like two boxes, huge boxes of shirts, right? <laughs> yeah. He had cowboy boots on. And they told us, this, you know, they were going to have a young boy. That's what, you know, they get a young boy to pick you up in that, right? Yeah. So he's got boxes on both shoulders. He's in <laughs> cowboy boots. <laughs> we're walking from the airport to get to, you know, to the car and everything. No young boy, no nothing. <laughs> so it was pretty, I guess, to us, it was funny watching Cactus Jack carry two big boxes. <laughs> so... And he wasn't happy about it. To be <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, usually, yeah. when I see Mick Foley, he's, he's smiling. But I, I've seen him when he's not smiling, and I, I can already picture it in my head. Um, yeah, super guy, super guy. Yeah. Uh, so look, I have to bring this up because I find it so fascinating that you know, after doing research on your early career, now you're in Big Japan. I'm sure you did a bit of uh, hardcore stuff in Puerto Rico, but some of this stuff seems a little out there. You have a no rope barbed wire matches, barbed wire board matches, and I'm gonna I'm gonna name some names here, and I'm gonna hope that I can pronounce them very well. Okay. Uh, you work with guys known as uh, Yuichi Taniguchi, Kendo Nagasaki, Mitsuhiro yep. Matsunaga, yeah, Seiji know. Yamakawa, Satoru Shiga, and Shinja Kajika. Uh, these are the, uh, I guess these are uh, uh, the main guys that you, you, you two work with while you're over there. Um, how did you adapt to this crazy environment with the barbed wire and all that stuff? Because for me, that just seems whew, that's some tough stuff. Oh, man, I don't know. I guess I, uh, I was excited as hell to be going to Japan, right? So, um, it was different. It was very different. Um, it's a whole different ball game. You know what I mean? I, uh, and over there, we wanted to be strong also. You know what I mean? So uh, I'm sure those guys got some stories of us landing in a little with them too. But um, it was it was a learning experience, brother. It was an eye opener. Let me tell you, you know what I mean? I never really, even in Puerto Rico, it was, you know, once in a while they had to do, 
the job, you know, the blade job, but we never did because we were in hoods. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Right. Uh, uh, yeah. Just a learning experience. Just, just, uh, you really got to learn how to protect yourself. Then, you know what I mean? Absolutely. You know, you carry yourself out there. Yeah. What do you feel you learned most about your time in Japan? Um, well, I remember one of the tours was actually with Terry Funk and Cactus Jack. And that's when they were really getting it over as the hardcore deal. Right. Terry was a legend by then. Cactus was definitely on his way to a fabulous career. But, uh, I remember Terry speaking with Jack and, uh, he says, okay, Jack, he goes, there's going to be a lot of photographers here tonight. He goes, let's get the picture. And I didn't know what the hell he was talking about, you know, at that point. Now, of course, he was a legend. He knows exactly what the hell's going on out there. And uh, the picture, which is a famous picture now, or believe it or not, is Terry Funk over Cactus Jack with his uh, branding iron and it's <laughs> flaming. Yeah. And they're like inches away from each other. And I just remember, man, there's so much more to think about in this business than just getting into the ring and, and doing your deal. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, that's true. And that's, wow. always, that's always stuck in my head. I mean, now, even though it's over, it always stuck in my head. That's it goes with life, too. You know what I mean? Get the picture, man. And, and sure enough, that picture has been... Uh, at least at that time, was it every wrestling magazine you could think yeah. of? So see, that shows you how smart these guys really were. You know what I mean? Wow. That's, yeah. As soon as you said that, the 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 light bulb went up above my head. I'm like, that is so smart. That is no wonder yeah. he's a legend. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Funny story? Yeah. All right. So during that tour, these guys are beating the hell out of each other. Literally. I mean, Terry, Terry's a snug, you know, a cactus is a snug. So one night, uh, we, what you do is you, you tour on a bus. All right. You go all over, like you go to Yokohama, you go to, uh, uh, Tokyo, you go to, uh, I don't know, a, a bunch of places over there. Right. So we're on the tour bus and they have a drink over there called Chu High. Loved purple chew high. So I'm drinking purple chew high. We're all drinking on the bus. Terry must have took a little medication or something because he was feeling it. So we're talking. We're all shooting the shit. Sharing road stories. Also, Terry's out like a light. He's just sitting there. He wakes up a little bit and he goes for a farmer blow and he misses his nose completely. <laughs> he goes... <laughs> missed it completely right he does it again missed it again looks over at the at the bus window and there's a curtain there he goes over blows his nose <laughs> falls right back to sleep <laughs> oh just hilarious, hilarious. i guess he had to be there but it was, it was, no, i can imagine it uh yeah. oh boy uh so look your, your, your time in Big Japan comes to an end. Then there's an opportunity to come into World Championship Wrestling. Um, and Mike told me his version of events. But tell me about how you found out about, okay, we're going to be working in WCW. We're going to be making our debut on Monday Nitro, 28th of, the, of uh, July, 1997, against Chris Benoit and Steve Fucking Mongo McMichael. Uh, <laughs> nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me a little bit about how you find out, okay, wow, well, we're going to be on Nitro and, and the hangmen are going to be there doing our thing and you're facing. If I'm not mistaken, we just back up just a little bit. Um, we were working for WCW on a nightly guarantee. Uh, Terry Taylor is the one that got us to hook up in there. I don't know why. Right. 
them two guys, Terry Taylor and Jimmy Hart, for some reason really liked us. I don't know if it was because we could work or, or, or whatever it was. You know, we weren't real ball busters in the back. We weren't, we didn't, we didn't buck the program. You know what I mean? We just, you know, still going back to that sort of being a yes guy. Right. Right. So Terry gets us in, we're working nightly on a nightly guarantee. And boy, they're bringing us in a lot, you know, and I'm thinking, wow, this is crazy actually. You know what I mean? I mean, they're bringing us in a lot. They're flying us all over the place. So that was on a nightly guarantee. So one Thursday night, because if I'm not mistaken, they would do like a Thursday Nitro, uh, Thursday Thunder. Yeah. And then the following night, they would tape for Saturday night. Or same thing with Monday. Monday, you'd do a Monday Nitro. Tuesday, they would go to the neighboring town and, and do the tapings for like Saturday night and pro and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So we are actually booked for an independent guy named Jay Trout on that Thursday. WCW gets in touch with us and says, hey, you have to be here. And us being the professionals that we are, we're going, hey, we're booked already. We can't just leave this guy high and dry, right? Jay Trout, his name was. And they go, man, you have to be here. You have to be here. And me and Mike are like, what? You know, what is going on? Yeah. So, of course we want to go with a national company, right? Instead of a guy just running an independent deal. And so we explained to Jay Trout, Hey man, they really want us. We need to be there Thursday. We get there Thursday. And, uh, boy, and let me just say this. They were putting a lot of guys under contract at that time. Yeah. I mean, just stacking the roster, lower guys, upper guys everywhere. Yeah. So we get there, and at that time, you talk to a production lady. I forget what her name was. Maybe Christine Johnson? No, I don't think it was that. Um, anyway, I can't remember. You know, like Andrea, or I think Andrea or something like that. Uh, any, anyway, she pulls us aside right away, guys. And she says, hey, we're going to give you guys a contract. You know, So that's when they really started applying us to like the nitros and, and thunders. I mean, we only did a handful of them, but I mean, that's when we knew we had a full-time gig. You know what I mean? All before that was basically, like I said, a night to night thing. Were they using this a lot? Absolutely. They were using this a lot, but that's when we knew it was solidified that, you know, when JJ Dillon comes over and tells you, Hey, you guys, you're good to go. You know, that's a pretty good feeling. Yeah. So that was right around that time. All right, cool. Um, and by the way, uh, I just got a message from Mike and he, he said, uh, uh, that bastard better put me over. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, I believe that, yeah. yeah. And, and, I, and I do. I, I put him over all the time. Like I said, he, he, he really helped me uh, in, in the business. Yeah. Uh, okay, so again, I'm bringing you back to Mongo. Uh, yes, 28th of July. Okay. So that's, 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 we thought that was going to be our match. If we could get something out of Mongo, we thought we were actually going to act, you know, maybe elevate ourselves. Right. Because that's really what our job was. Yeah. Our job was to sort of make the guy that wasn't too great look great. Right. Of course, yeah. And to be honest with you, we were pretty good at it. So we're thinking, all right, man, we, you know, Benoit, uh, consummate professional in the ring, just fabulous. So we weren't worried about that. It was the Mongo deal, right? So we get rolling. Everything's going fabulous. Live TV. We're feeling good about ourselves. And Mongo jumps ahead and starts, I don't know, puts Mike up in for a pile driver that wasn't even supposed to be done at that time. And yeah. He couldn't handle Mike, so he scores back in a corner and comes off the road. It was, it was a shit show, to be honest with you, Carl. Yeah. So <laughs> after that match, uh, we walked by through the gorilla position, you know, into the back, and Terry's looking at us sort of like, you know, and shaking his head a little bit, and I wanted just to go over and go, dude, that wasn't our fault. Yeah, of course. 
So I, I really think that was one of the things being on a live TV show. And then unfortunately him screwing it up uh, um, cost us getting elevated, I believe. And who knows? Maybe that's just me and that's how I think, you know what I mean? But I, I think there was more out there for the Texas hangman slash disorderly conduct if if that match would have – if we could have made Mondo look like a million bucks because God knows that was hard, we could have probably elevated ourselves, I think. Yeah, yeah. When I, when I interviewed Mike, he, he said that this was – a really important match and Mongo just came in, just, just not listening, not the timing was off with him. And you, you, you guys had coordinated this finish where Benoit was going to lock in the cross face on you and he was going to yeah. stick Mike with the uh, pile driver. But he, I think he was supposed to, he was supposed to maybe push Mike into the turnbuckle first, then Mike was going to turn around into it. But instead he just picked him up and tried to, to stick him with a pile driver and oh, it, it, in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Like, he, he scoops him up. <laughs> me and Chris are looking at each other. Right. So I take the punch at Chris. So he puts me into the deal, right. Takes, drives me yeah. down to the ground and puts me in the cross face. So we got to the finish, but if, if you're old school, guess what? If you don't get the finish, the match sucked. Mm. You can do whatever you wanted, but if, if, if you know, I mean, every high spot and nail every high spot and all your work. But if you don't nail the finish, match with the shits. <laughs> that was the rule. You know what? You got to nail the finish. That's the and, most important thing. And, and look, I want to I want to make sure that you both feel better about yourselves with this situation with Mongo, because I saw a match with Mongo against Kurt Hennig for the U.S. title main event of Nitro when Hennig beat him for the U.S. title. Even Kurt Hennig could not get a good match out of him. I remember watching it being like, oh, my God. Not even Kurt can get anything out of this guy. I mean, Mongo is a, a football legend, and Absolutely. for whatever reason, he's one of the greatest of all time in that sport. But when he, when I watch Mongo wrestle, it's like watching – if you ever like have seen like a dog trying to stand in the back of a family car while it's moving – and the dog's all over the place. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what I equate Mongo to. He's like a dog in the back of the family car or like a cow trying to walk on ice. Just, just yep. not. Not very <laughs> sure for it. You would think that, you know, a, a football um, legend would, but anyway, it is what it is. Uh, so you feel and Mike feel like because of this now, uh, Texas Hangman, eventually disorderly conduct and now being pigeonholed into just being this spot when if it went well, it could have been uh, a different story. Um, I, that's my belief. I, I think, uh, don't get me wrong. We weren't going to be a top tier guy either, but we could have definitely got to the middle of the card and actually meant a little, a little more. I, I believe. Yeah. Cool, man. Um, so I'm just going to name, name some matches here that you guys had as the hangman before. It was disorderly conduct. Uh, you work on the 12th of the 8th, 97 against Conan and six on Saturday night. The 26th of the 8th against Harlem Heat. The 9th of the 9th against the Faces of Fear, which is, you know, the Barbarian and Meng, which is, Absolutely. you know. And, of course, the 10th of the 10th against Dog Dean and Robbie Brookside on WCW Pro, where you guys picked up the win. Uh and then we move on to a dark match on Nitro against Los Vianos, uh, 10th of the 11th, 97. This is, from my uh, research, the first disorderly conduct match. Can you tell me what you remember about coming up with the name and the outfits of what became so synonymous with disorderly conduct? Uh Terry comes to us and says, fellas, we want to keep using you. You know, we were under a deal. Uh, like I said, I think Terry just always liked our work. I mean, he was a worker. He knew how to work. So he appreciated our, uh, our work. He goes, but I'm going to tell you guys, all these guys were coming in at that time from Mexico. Okay. Uh, La Parca, Ray was there. I mean, there were, you know, 15 guys with hoods on. Yeah, yeah. So Terry says, Hey, you guys got to come up with a new gimmick. 
goes uh, and have it by the next TV. You know, you know what I mean. So, <laughs> so we come home and uh, actually, uh, Trevor Heartbreaker Adonis. Uh, we brainstormed a little bit and got some names together. And from that, we got disorderly conduct. Okay. So um, he's really the one that came up with the name. Um, as far as tights go, like, you know, uh, we always knew we wanted the long coat, uh, you know, the duster. Uh, and we just sort of would try to go with colors that nobody else was wearing to maybe set us apart a little bit. So that's where like the purple and silver and black came in. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, just the word disorderly all screwed up, you know, looking disorderly. Right. I mean, <laughs> just, in our heads, that seemed to go. So that that's really where that came up with. Very cool, bro. Very cool. Um, so here's a big one. 24th of November, uh, 1997. You face the Steiners for the world tag titles on Nitro. So that's a pretty big moment in the very early career of the newly um, dubbed disorderly conduct. Tell me a little bit about what it was like working with the Stein brothers. Snug, you know, but like <laughs> I said, he come from that, that era also, you know what I mean? Plus Chris Scott, he's a shooter, you know, he, and boys went to Michigan and they did wrestle. So, you know what I mean? I mean, it was, there was no goofing around. Um, Again, uh, very excited just to be on live TV, you know, because most of the stuff that we did was Saturday night or, or, or wrestling pro or whatever second tier shows that they had back then. Yeah. So we're excited. Um, I remember that match very well because unfortunately the first time Scotty goes up to get me on his shoulders, he doesn't get me up. So he's got a, yeah, he's got a double, <laughs> double clutch and then he gets me up right i mean i was 265 pounds at that time right so i mean i was a load and i wasn't sandbagging it just never took it right so gets me up the second time gives me the finish to do the bulldog from behind off the top rope everything's good get back in the back of scotty i'm sorry dude i, I wasn't sandbagging you you know and i'm thinking i'm gonna you know i'm thinking <laughs> I'm getting my ass handed to me when I get back there. <laughs> well, I mean, like, it's, it's Scott Steiner, so I mean. <laughs> yeah, well, thank God he wasn't Big Papa Pump at the time, or I would have got my ass handed to me, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, so, I mean, they were okay with it. it. You know, once again, live TV, not stellar by no means. Very good match up until the finish. The finish, the yeah. important part, right? So, little story with that. Next day we go to do Saturday. TV yeah. for their tapings, go to the board, Texas Hangman against the Steiner brothers. Uh, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So I'm thinking, okay, this is where payback is coming, right? So <laughs> I'm really thinking we're going to ha- get it handed to us. Right. So we get the finish, obviously their finish. Scott just looks at me and goes, can we do it right tonight? Bonehead. I said, yes, sir, we will do it right tonight. And we got it. So, you know, just, uh, you know, pretty intimidating gentleman he is. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. You, you got to come full circle and, and redo yeah. it and get it right. That's good. Yeah. Uh, I, I, and, 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 and I'm sure to the, the, the attempt of doing it with the Steiners, you know, and, and get it right this time is fine. I'm sure the idea of maybe trying to redo it with Mongo, uh, let's, let's just leave that one. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it deserves to be forgotten about carol let me tell you <laughs> um so, so i mean 97 is such a big year for wcw and as you said that they're, they're putting a lot of people under contract and there's so many people on the roster and uh two guys you work with on the 16th of december 97 barry darso and john nord um I just wanted to bring up some different names here at this point because uh, it, it's hard to, to interview disorderly conduct about their WCW run because I can't talk about this angle or that angle. I have to talk about matches because, unfortunately, it seemed like they didn't really care too much about tag team wrestling at certain points in time. Um, but any memories of working with, with uh, the hilarious Barry Darso and John Nord? 
Uh, Barry, night off, fabulous <laughs> guy. Know Barry actually pretty well. Uh, John Nord, Crowbar. Uh, just, oh, man, I don't know how long you're in the business that long. And, and, and I learned to work. I mean, he was just a crowbar, bro. I, nice guy, you know, but another, you know, getting a little lost and, and not knowing where the hell we are. And I'm doing it. I remember, I remember I'm going, <laughs> John, John, you're going to pick me up and you're going to slingshot me off the top rope. Right. And I'm telling him this right as we're standing there and he's going, I'm shooting you in, damn it. I'm going, okay. <laughs> Shoot me in, man. Yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, still, you know, pretty good match, but it's just, it's just, you know, things like that with big guys, you know, <laughs> very fabulous guy, uh, consummate professional, pretty light out there knows how to work not saying John Nord didn't know how to work you know but some guys are a little rougher than others I guess you know yeah I just I just want to put this out there I I, I think Barry Darso was hysterical as uh as hole in one Barry Darso um I don't know if you oh, were expecting black top bully black top bully <laughs> he's just uh I just I just I really I because I, I, I've essentially seen every single episode of WCW Saturday Night from 95 till it uh, eventually uh, was taken off TV in 2000. But I'll get to that part a bit later. Uh, the Public Enemy, 6th of January, 1998. Uh, the first match uh, to Sully Conduct have in 98. Tell me a little bit about working with the Masters of the Tables. Uh, Teddy and Mike, fabulous guys. Um weren't they weren't they let us work i mean work you know what i mean they they come from from a time where if you beat a guy that doesn't mean anything who'd you beat exactly you know what i mean you didn't beat nobody i mean you know so they come from the school where hey let's actually have a match and get our stuff over, you know what I mean? So if, if, you, if you watch those matches, I, I mean, were we enhancement guys, I guess? Yes, even as disorderly conduct, but nobody squashed us. You know what that, I mean? We always worked, you know, we always worked with, because they knew they could get a match, you know? So I think that was public enemy's idea. Hey man, these guys, they can work. Let's, we're getting some TV time. Let's, let's, let's make it look like a match. Yeah. So those uh, guys were great. They really were. I really feel like they don't get the props that they deserve. Um, rest in peace to both of them. Um, because, you know, the Dudley boys came along and did the tables, and that's what everyone thinks about. But, you know, they were the ones that kind of really put that thing on the map, as far as oh, yeah. I'm concerned. Um, you know, disrespect to Sabu, who I know was someone who was quite big on the tables even before Public Enemy. But uh, anyway, another tag team I wanted to bring up, and, and uh, Mike had some interesting things to say. High Voltage. Uh, what did you think of these guys? Uh, they were power plant guys, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Jack to the gills. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't like to pass judgment on anybody. Not, they weren't that great. You know, they, they, I don't know if they got hot shotted, you know what I mean? And thought, Hey, we, and there was no reason for that at that time because they had so much talent there. You know what I mean? But they, I think they got hot shotted right out of the power plant, boom, right to TV, which I guess that happens a lot nowadays. Of course, yeah. But, you know, you don't – I think in a situation like that, you don't really appreciate the other guy giving you his body because that's really what we're doing, right? We're saying, okay, I'm going to let you take my body. I'm going to let you do with what you want but be safe with it. You know what I mean? And I just think they, you know, uh, you know, when you're green, it's, it's, uh, ah, man, when you, when you're green, you get nervous quick and you, you know, and you, 
you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, just it's like, dude, relax. We'll get you through this. You know, but I would, you know, guys that want here again, two young guys that just wanted to get themselves over. I'm right. not saying they were bad or anything. I just think they got hot shotted and they, they didn't get time to get seasoned before they presented them. I'll tell you, that's probably a team, if they would have seasoned them up a little bit, probably could have meant something. Yeah. No, oh, I agree. I, I could see the potential in them. You know, Kenny was yes. quite uh, athletic and could do those, you know, springboards and all that stuff. Yep. And, yep. and Rob, Robbie was just like a little bulldozer you know what i mean uh yep. but um those are two guys that i've just i've i've never found out whatever happened to those guys they've just disappeared off the face of the earth um i've been wanting yeah, to i, I don't them, know i don't know either and i've never even after we were done i never heard of them out on the independence or anything or, or nothing like that yeah no they just completely disappeared if anyone out there watching this podcast if you know whatever happened to high voltage Robbie Rage and Kenny Chaos, please send us a, uh, a comment on this uh, interview and let us know if you know anything. Um, so I wanted to bring another thing up. It's something that, that bothers Mike to this day, is that WCW brought out these cards called signature cards. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yes, and there's a, yeah. there is a Tough Tom signature <laughs> card. <laughs> But there is no main Mike signature card. And I'm just going to go on the internet quickly. I, I need to just, just really quote this here. Tough Tom card, WCW. There is a Tough Tom card. Holy shit. There is a t- there's two Tough Tom cards for sale on eBay right now. One is for $225.82 with uh, $26 postage. This is Australian dollars, by the way. Uh, and uh, $193.55 for another one. Um, so, yeah, I got him, hey, Carl, I got him sitting right here. You want him? <laughs> <laughs> no, just, just kidding, bro. I don't know <laughs> Anyway, uh, you, you got your own little signature car there, but uh, not me and Mike. Uh, why do you think that is? Do you, do, you, do you think that WCW saw more in Tough Tom having a signature car than me and Mike? Well, I am a little better looking, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, funny story, brother. Uh, you know, one day we're, we're home. Like that, at that time, I think the loop was like, like uh, 12 days. Okay, so you'd be on the road for 12 days. That's all you, for the month, 12 days. Okay, wow. Okay, so one day I, my front porch, you know, all of a sudden there's a box there. Like, because, like, they didn't give me no heads up. Hey, you know, they're going to be sending you cards. You got to sign, right? So they send a thousand cards. And I open it up and I see, holy shit, I a tough time card, you know? So I get on the horn right away. Hey, Mike, I said, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> <laughs> I got a top collecting card. I said, I'm sure yours is going to be there any day. <laughs> so like a week goes by and I go, brother, did you get your card? <laughs> no, brother. He goes, I don't know what the hell happened. I, I'm going, oh man. I, you know, so now I'm all of a sudden I'm going, oh man, you know. You can't be too so excited. Was saying that man. package never came. That package <laughs> never came. And I wound up signing a thousand of them. Wow, maybe what well, maybe just got lost in the post. Maybe there's a thousand unsigned Mean Mike cards out there. Uh, uh, wow. Well, you know yeah, what? I, I, I still get heat to that to this day for that, Kyle. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I, I've 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 come up with a solution for the whole thing. I have I have saved pictures of your tough Tom card, and I have sent them to a friend of mine who is a graphic designer. And he makes uh, basketball cards for local little league basketball leagues here in uh, in uh, Perth. And he's very good at what he does. And I've said, can you please make a complete replica of this, but put a picture of Mean Mike there. <laughs> we'll have the Mean Mike signature card. And I'm going to get I'm going to get a couple of them made, and I'm going to send them to him. And then, dude, he's going to love you for that. I've already told him he's uh, he's very excited, but yeah, I, I I want to avenge that for him so that there can now be a full set that you can get of disorderly conduct for several hundred dollars on eBay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so anyway, away from the signature card now, but that was a great story. I didn't uncover that one when I um, interviewed Mike uh, because we talked about that after the fact, but uh, the Armstrong brothers, 
Disorderly Conduct and the Armstrong Brothers, Scott and Steve. Those were some great fucking matches, bro. Um, and I'll tell you what, like, it was exciting for me to see you guys get your first win on Saturday night against the Armstrongs. You you worked a couple of times with them, trading back and forth with victories. But tell me a little bit about working with the Armstrongs because it just seemed like the two teams meshed very well. Oh, uh, you know, two utility teams that can work. You know what I mean? I mean, it yeah. was fabulous, bro. I'm serious. Like a night off, but still, in my eyes, not tearing the house down, but doing a pretty darn good job. Uh, easy to work with both, you know, come from a wrestling family, uh, uh, fabulous guys in and out of the ring. I mean, hung out quite a bit with the, the Armstrong brothers, uh, fun, just fun, fun and no fucked up finish. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great bro. Um, yeah, they're fun, fun guys. So you, you, you mentioned this a little bit earlier about how, you know, you guys were a team that would be able to have, you know, um, a, a nice competitive tag team match and, you know, and it would always look good, except if you're wrestling Mongo. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> the 6th of the 10th, all of a sudden, you know, you guys are this competitive tag team. Okay, you're not getting that many wins, but it's, it's always competitive. You're not getting squashed. But then you lose a handicap match against Scott Hall. Uh, and I know it, it bothers Mike a little bit. And I think at the time he was like, you know, we have competitive tag matches. I know that they want to make Scott look good for the, I guess it was an upcoming pay-per-view, but how did you feel about, you know, okay, you're getting us to lose pretty convincingly to one guy. I think he sat on both of you for the pinfall. What are your memories of that? And how did that make you feel? Uh, one other time in the business, I wish I would have said no. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, honestly, a little humiliating. Uh, um, once again, just being yes guys. Oh, you know, Hey, do what you're told, go out there and do it. So we did it. Um, I just wish we would have pushed back a little bit on, on, on a few things going through our career. I mean, um, you know, especially once we were under contract, I think we should have spoke up for ourselves a little bit more, uh, uh, once again, I think that just goes back to our training. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. that was that was uh, uh, yeah, just not a good thing, you know. That that really hurted our psyche and everything. To be honest with you, you know what I mean. It, it just uh, he didn't need to get put over. He's he's freaking Razor Ramon and and Scott Hall. You know what I mean? I mean, he yeah, definitely didn't need. You know, you know, you could have put. Two and enha real enhancement talent in there with them, you know what I mean? It wouldn't have, it wouldn't have mattered. Yeah, or I could so have yeah, a singles match against one of yous, you know, and right, right, yeah, with the other one getting involved and then kicking the shit out of both of us or something, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or, so, yeah, I think that the ride home was quiet. Let's put it that way. Yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, um, and. <laughs> I made this point when I spoke to Mike, uh, late 1998, they're not even using the tag titles. They're barely even using them. And they still got a bunch of tag teams, you know, around the place, you know, Faces of Fear, the Armstrongs, Disorderly Conduct, High Voltage. And I, it always bothered me and my friend Kevin. We, we're always like, why don't they just like put the belts on one of these teams? Why don't they just, you know, you got some tag teams there. You're not doing anything with the tag belts. Just leave it up to Jimmy Hart, I believe, who kind of was more involved in what happened on Saturday night. Leave it up to him to do something on Saturday night with the belts if you're not going to do anything with them on television. I, I guess Eric Bischoff wasn't really – I've heard he wasn't very big on tag team wrestling. But, you know, what are your thoughts on that and, and, and how WCW seemed to go from a, a company that was really big on tag team wrestling to all of a sudden they've got tag titles that are inactive for months on end. I think uh, uh, at around that time was still NWO stuff and they were concentrating so much on that because of the viewing wars between WWF or E, whichever you want to call it, and, and, and uh, WCW. And I think Eric Bischoff had a lot to do with that because like you said, he, you know, he, he, he 
he's worried about single superstars. You know what I mean? I don't yeah. know why he didn't like tags or, or, or what the case is, but I think a lot of that just got lost in NWO stuff. And I mean, Christ, every segment was an NWO thing. If, if you remember back then, you know what I mean? So yeah. I think that it just, just got lost in the fold, you know, just like for a long time, lady uh, women wrestlers got lost in the fold. Now look, they're hotter than hell, you know? They, yeah. They just, Gets lost in the fold. You know, there's a lot of things going on, especially when it's live, you know, and just got lost, I think, really. Yeah. And and you know what? I, I, I've i seen everything, every single episode of everything from WCW from 95. I'm up to about April of 2000 right now. It's taken me seven years to get there, but I've seen every episode of Main Event Pro, Worldwide, Saturday. I've seen everything. That's how much of a nerd I am. Um, <laughs> but me and my friend Kevin, and I'm just taking a little sidebar here because you mentioned yep. this this thing with the television show and the focus on the NWO. We found that everything started going wrong around the time that they had probably just after the Dennis Rodman, Carl Malone thing, and then they were leading into Jay Leno and all that stuff. The TV show Nitro specifically seemed like a complete mess, like all the great angles and things that were going on before. Now it just seemed like it was just cold match after cold match after cold match. And Eric would be out there doing his little Jay Leno ripoffs on nitro and uh, the segments would go so long and they weren't entertaining. And it's such a, a channel changer. That is when things went wrong with WCW as far as we're concerned. Um, and yeah, you're right. Like I'm a massive NWA fan, but even at that point, it was just like, phew, like they're just, they're, they're, they've beaten this thing into the ground beaten. now. And, and the other, cha- the other channel with the, with the WWF, they're doing some crazy shit, crazy shit. So well, attitude era started then, right? That's it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I guess it'll lead to a random question for me. You're in WCW. You s- are you seeing what's happening on the WWF? Are you thinking to yourself, maybe we should get out of here and maybe hop over there? Um, that question didn't really come up until we got released from WCW. I'll be honest, uh, from where we were coming from and everything, we were just happy to be getting a, a constant paycheck. You know what right. I mean? I mean, uh, like I said, it goes back to us how we were taught and everything. I mean, right. That's, that's, that's basically what kind of person you turn out to, right. However you were taught. Right. So we were taught. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> WWF thing didn't really come up till after we got released from WCW actually right after WCW. I think we did a thing with Jimmy Hart for a little while. That was the XWF. Yeah, I've got that in my notes. So I'm definitely interested to talk about that, but uh, we're not there yet, Tom. We're not there yet. Yep. I have to. I have to stay with my timeline. Yep. Uh, <laughs> uh, so they finally do get the tag titles back underway in early '99, and the first tag champions, I believe, out of the gate. It might have either been Benoit and Malenko, or, or no, it was Barry Windham and Kurt Hennig. But that's a pretty great tag team for you guys to work with. You work with them on Saturday night for the tag team titles. Any stories of working with Kurt Hennig? Uh, You know, he's another guy like Owen Hart. Every time I see an opportunity to bring him up, I have to do it. Uh, I I do remember actually working them guys both. uh, I was a big, you know, back in the NWA, I was a big, big uh, uh, Barry Mark. Uh, I thought he was fabulous man I awesome mean, bro barry windham was was definitely you know heads above everybody else if you ask me i mean his work rate just just everything you know uh probably not a fantastic interviewer but that ain't really what i was after i was after work rate you know what i mean as far as uh funny stories really didn't hang out with kurt or, or, or barry uh Fabulous guys in the ring, you know what I mean? I mean, and, and let us work, you know. That's, it's hard sometimes to keep steam yeah. when, when, when you know, you're an underneath guy, you know what I mean? So Absolutely. anytime any top guys let us work, we felt real good about it. And uh, uh, that in itself is memorable to me, you know what I mean? 
Yeah, no, and it's really cool. You, you say you're a big Barry Mark, and now you get to I had the chance to work with him a couple of times. So that's another feather in the cap kind of thing. You, you, you got to work with someone that you kind of, I guess, looked up to in the business bit. Um, Absolutely, I would definitely would uh, if I could get to that work. Or if, when I was in, if I could have got to that work rate, absolutely. Uh, another one that I really uh, got in the business and thought was fabulous, Arn Anderson. You know, got oh, to talk with him every fire. week. You know, he's, I mean, there's no, nothing better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nothing better than the enforcer. Are you kidding me? I mean. I agree, I got, I got to meet that I really like Fit Finley. Fit oh, Finley. yeah. I love Fit Finley, bro. He's great. Fabulous. Man. Looks like he's killing you. He ain't even touching you. Exactly. Yeah. It's fabulous. fabulous. <laughs> so those um, were the kind of workers that I liked anyway. So I guess the Scott Hall match was a precursor to this one here. Okay. Well, if we need a tag team to put over a singles wrestler, our team is going to be disorderly conduct fifth of the eighth 99 against Sid on thunder. Is this another instance where you wish you said no? Now, if this is the one I'm thinking about, and I'm not sure if it is, but I remember Sid had two guys that went through their his school. Okay, uh, I think it was a rage guy too, and a, a, you mentioned him before. It was one of our wins. Ah, oh, I uh, okay. Yeah, I know so, you mean. I don't know, lone wolves or something. They were I don't know what the hell they were called. Yeah. Anyway. If, if if I'm thinking about the right match is after we beat them, we get the stick and we say, you know, we're sick of hearing this, Sid, this, Sid, that, blah, That's blah, it. blah. Yeah, yeah. And here comes Sid. So at least there was a little uh, story behind that. You know, I mean, it's sort of like we were the dumbasses for calling them out, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So if so, if that's the incident I'm thinking of, which I think it is. Yeah, it is because uh, uh, well, Mike Mike got on the on the mic. Yeah. So I, I in that instance, I don't think I would have said no. You know what I mean? It's just like when you're when two guys get announced against one guy, that's one thing. This was sort of something for stories line's sake we brought on ourselves is the way i look at it you know right I mean? so it's 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 at least cool because you guys are getting your comeuppance because you you called out this guy and you probably shouldn't right. have done that in the first place absolutely, absolutely okay rather than just going out there cold and losing to scott hall for no reason right right i get you just made a little more sense to me yeah no that's cool um so okay i want to fast forward a little bit now um, WCW Saturday night is now no longer going to be on TBS. Uh, they're changing it to WCW Saturday morning and it's going to be a recap show from April until August of 2000. Um, when that, when you find out about that, do you start to worry? Cause that was kind of the bread and butter of uh, disorderly conduct. You would always be on Saturday night. And if not, you would probably show up on worldwide. Did you feel like, okay, this is something that we should be worried about? Um, the only time that we questioned our uh, uh, time there or, or contract being valid was when they changed bookers and Kevin Nash became the booker. I uh, can't remember who had the book right before him. I would imagine it was probably Eric. Yeah, I think Eric anyway, gave it up to, to Kevin Nash, yeah, and before Eric was. Yeah. Okay, so that's the only time we really became worried. I mean, we were pretty sure in our work rate and everything, so, you know, it was. I guess if the powers to be wanted to let us go, they'd let us go, you know what I mean? I mean, okay. there was really nothing we could have done about it, but I remember us actually going up to Kevin and, Asking Kevin, hey man, just wondering, you know, or am I still going to pay be able to pay the bills next month and then? And he looked right at both of us and said, "Hey man, don't worry about it. You guys are good." So, so That's we good. were pretty comfortable with all the way, all the way till the end, you know. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, there was we a. Right. It was like a late March, 
uh, 2000, uh, the final TV match that you guys had was against Harlem Heat 2000, which is Stevie Ray and Big T, also known as Ahmed Johnson, uh, on Worldwide. Uh, so that's the actual final TV match of Disorderly Conduct. How did you find out that you guys weren't going to be used by WCW going forward? Um, if I'm not mistaken, JJ Dillon pulled us aside and said, Hey fellas, you see what's going on around here. I mean, it, they were definitely declining at that point, you know, yep. way too much money was spent and, and the product was losing to be honest with you by that time wwe was taking over and yeah you know in the in the rating wars for live tv so jj comes up to us and says hey guys you know we're not going to be able to uh use you guys anymore he goes but we're going to pay you out for the rest of your contract and i don't know that was probably I don't, a few months maybe five months four months something like that but anyway the check kept coming and and uh we came back once our contract was over. I did a show in, uh, in my area, had Sergeant Slaughter come in. And of course, Slaughter was with WWE and he was an uh, agent. Yep. So that's basically how we get supposedly a WWF tryout was through Sergeant Slaughter. Right. That's the 18th of the 9th, 2000 on WWF Jacked. The Texas Hangman uh, loser match to the Dups. Um, what was your recollection of, and how did it feel, firstly, to be back in the WWF locker room after, geez, eight years? And uh, why do you feel that you didn't get signed at that time? Um, uh, I don't know. I, I in hindsight, looking back, I think uh, Sergeant Slaughter just did that as a favor to us. Okay. You know what I mean? Because you, you, you get a feel when you're there if somebody's going to be sitting at the monitor watching or not. Right. Be, I, I just don't think anybody was even at the monitor watching. Okay. You know. Uh, I understand that. Yeah, that must be a little bit disheartening. Uh, but, you know, at least it, it, that did happen. Um, you know, so it's still pretty cool that you know you guys got on wf tv in 2000 but here's an interesting one <laughs> i don't understand why this match even happened but you wrestle the shane twins in a dark match on thunder in gainesville florida and it's four days before wcw is announced to be bought by vince mcmahon i don't know why they're giving um the shane twins a a, a dark match here because well, they, they're not going to sign them because <laughs> The company is just about over. Um, but still, you have this start match. You, you haven't been there for, for several months at this point. Tell me a little bit about that. I believe we did the Shane, uh, the Shane Twins deal. Mike knew them. Yeah. Okay. I, I, from Florida, the Florida area. Two nice guys, very nice guys. Um, and... I don't know how it came about that we actually got that match. I think it was sort of asked because I, because at that time they thought they were having a try, you know, a, a real tryout, right? Right. Like nobody, you know, uh, hindsight, we knew it was getting sold, but at that time it was, you know, <clears throat> and I think they felt comfortable with me and Mike just because we knew him and Mike really knew him and I think they would thought that that would be their best shot of, uh, of getting some kind of deal, you know, right. like I say, it's 2020, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, I just thought it was crazy that it was four days before uh, it was announced that Vince McMahon had bought the company. What did you think when you first heard that WCW was sold to Vince McMahon? Um, Vince did it again. <laughs> you know, you, got, you know, he's, he's, he's Vince McMahon, bro. There, there's, I'll be honest. I, you know, never really knowing Vince besides walking through a hallway going, Mr. McMahon, how are you today? You know, um, he's the guy, you know what I mean? There's, you know, let's put it this way in between them that time, let's say the nineties and, and even 2000, if you're working for a promoter and he says, I'm going to run against Vince, 
pick your bag up and walk out because you're not, nobody's running against Vince. Yeah. You know what I mean? So bottom line, you know, I, we were in a couple of situations like that. The, uh, the AWF, okay. Guy named Paul Alperstein starts with us in Windy City with, with, with Sam Becero. He's our manager. Okay. For some reason, he's hot on the Texas hangman, right? Well, he has a lot of money. Yeah. He starts his AWF, the American Wrestling Federation. We go work for him. We get pushed. I mean, push good, too. But, you know, I remember, like, in a pre-taped deal, oh, we're going to run up against Vince. And I'm thinking, oh, man, this, you know, it just ain't yeah. happening. You guys, first of all, don't have enough money. And you guys don't have the talent that he, you know, or the creative mind. Yeah. I mean, Chris, the AWF, Tito Santana, Sergeant Slaughter, uh, uh man uh loaded but not with new guys you know what i mean with 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 the golden era guys you know what i right, mean and, yeah and uh so that never took off so i guess my point is any promoter ever looks at you and says hey we got tv and we're gonna run against vince don't bother brother yeah it's a full gun conclusion uh <laughs> yeah yeah you know. um, proven many times you're gonna fail <laughs> So I asked me, Mike, about this, and I figured I'd throw this one your way. I don't, I'm, I don't know if you watched the product or anything like that, but what did you think about how they handled this WCW invasion of the WWF and this uh, <laughs> attempt at uh, having WCW kind of uh, be a part of the WWF? Obviously, everyone knows that you know anyone could have booked that better than they did, but your point of view how how do you feel they made a misstep with that oh i don't know i you know i <laughs> i don't have a fabulous mind for the business i can go out there and work you know but i mean some of these guys i mean they live it breathe it you know with their cornflakes in the morning and with their steak at night you know i was never that guy uh I was just athletic and, and did my job. You know what I mean? So I don't, I let that for the higher powers to be, you know, the, you know, because it's theirs anyway. Right. What I think really doesn't matter in the big scheme of things. <laughs> well, still, I think if you were put in charge of booking it, I think uh, even with what you've just said, you would have done a better job as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carl. <laughs> so the XWF, okay, I get to find out about this. Obviously, Jimmy Hart is big in this. Uh, it's the 14th and 11th, 2001. You wrestled Vampiro, in which I believe is supposed to be the sixth episode that was taped. Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe you worked some more matches uh, for them as well. But, um, you know, uh, how did you feel about this experiment? And, you know, were you hopeful that it would lead to something? Um or was this just like, uh, you know, you were given an opportunity to, to work a match and you took it? No, I, I think, um, first of all, if you step back just a little bit, when I say, you know, I need to, to give big kudos to Jimmy Hart. Jimmy Hart was really the one that kept us around in WCW because he sold us as two gimmicks. You know what I mean? As the Texas Hangman and Disorderly Conduct. Right. So they're getting they're getting double for their money is the way Jimmy presented it. Right. So he was always a big supporter in disorderly conduct, the Texas hangman, whatever you want to say. So I had, I had good feelings about it. I thought, Hey man, this, this may be our real break, you know, because Jimmy ain't just going to squash us because he knows us. He knows we know how to work and so on. Uh, by then, I'm definitely looking at that we're we are consummate professionals. You know, we you know we're not out on the road raising hell. You know, just what you know the boys get in a lot of trouble out on the road. You know what I mean? So yeah, uh, we just tried to steer ourselves away from that. And yeah, I thought you know with Jimmy, same thing like with uh, uh, Paul Elperstein. I thought, hey man, he's in our corner. We're definitely going to get a push. You know what I mean? I thought this could also be that kind of deal. And actually it turned out to be just about the exact same thing. Yeah. I mean, they thought they were going to run against the big guys and it, it just never came to be. Yeah. I, I think uh, one of the main 
issues was I think uh, the WWF brought Hogan back and uh, also Hennig and a, a lot of the top name. I think Jerry Lawler went Lawler went back for commentary as well. So it was already like straight away WWF came in and picked off a couple yeah. of guys and uh, yep. yeah. But I, I I have the DVD of the lost episodes of the XWF and I could see where they were going with it and I really liked where it was going like storyline wise and you know if the commissioner of the company is going to be sable then i'm i'm going to be tuning in that's for sure <laughs> <I'm in. laughs> um so i wanted to fast forward to 2003 a company called wisconsin organized wrestling yeah. um wow that seemed to be something that you know you were quite prominent in for uh, a period of time there um please like you know tell me a little bit about how Okay, you go from this thing, disorderly conduct, WCW, this XWF thing happens, you know, soon after in 2001. Um, there's like a, a, a blank spot there where I don't know what happened between then and 2003 with WOW. But um, how did you get involved with this company? And, um, you know, what are some of your uh, fondest memories there? Okay, this is... Uh, uh between the dark spot you're talking about is really where I just went back to start working independence in the Midwest. Okay. okay. Now, fortunately I got to do it as tough Tom. Yeah. Right. With, with some TV credibility. Right. So, so these two guys start up uh, the Wisconsin organized wrestling, which they called wow. And um, since I'm from Wisconsin, I think they just thought I would be the best fit to be their heavyweight champion. You know, I mean, it, I, yeah. I had, the most, I had the most uh, ring tenure under my belt and I don't want to pat myself on the back and pull up Barry Horowitz, but I could work. You know what I mean? So, yeah. So uh, <clears throat> that's really, I think that's why they picked me. You know what I mean? They called me up and said, Hey, we're going to start this thing. Would you be interested? We'd like to put the strap on you. And I said, oh, sure. Of course. I mean, you know, it's, 70 miles away. Oh, that's awesome, man. So what was it like being a, like a, a top guy for a, for a wrestling company? <laughs> I mean, tell me about that. I mean, all these years, you know, the, the struggle in WCW and you're the top guy, you're the heavyweight champion. Come on, man. That's, that's pretty cool. Uh, it was, it was, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was a good feeling uh, to be honest with you through the Midwest uh, and my area just because I'm a hometown boy, I was sort of over, you know, I mean, even when I was getting my ass kicked on TV, my buddies loved it. You know what I mean? So, and my town loved it, you know? Uh, so, uh, another great experience. The nice thing I liked about that is I could actually start teaching guys, uh, uh, how to protect your gimmick <laughs> things. I didn't get taught. <laughs> Yeah. How to protect yourself, how to protect your gimmick, you know, uh, um, even at that time, it wasn't a big spot fest. You know what I mean? You got to tell a story. You got to tell a story out there. And, and, and on spot shows, that's where you do that kind of thing. You know, you tell the story. Yeah. It, there's, there's certain things you do at, at certain things in, at certain times in a match and, 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 certain things you just never do, you know? So I like that part of it. Uh, also, uh, I brought my wife in, she was my valet, uh, you know? So, uh, at a, at a small deal like that, I think it's all right. Otherwise don't ever bring your wife into the business. I'll tell you. It ain't gonna last. <laughs> um, but, uh, it was a good experience. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was a lot of fun to travel with my wife a little bit. Yes. We're still together. <laughs> and, uh, you know, yeah. So no, fantastic. Uh, just a good experience, I guess. Really, a, 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 a good way to finish it up. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's cool, bro. Um, so another thing I wanted to bring up because I really liked the story when Mike told it, but um, there was a Texas Hangman retirement match. It was uh, the three of you for the first time ever, I believe. The three of you. All under the hood, one last time. Uh, 
tell me about that. I know Mike, you know, looks back and, and thinks that the match maybe could have been better or whatever, but this is a nice thing. You know, you guys get to, Mike gets to retire and he gets to do it as, you know, with the Texas hangman, all three of you together. Uh, uh, history making, I guess you'd have to say, first of all, right. I mean, at no other time did you ever see three Texas hangmen, right? I mean, it was, uh, yeah. um, you know, uh, sort of demolitionish, if you will. You know what I mean? Course, uh, yeah. uh, we had all three of them. Um, uh, strange feelings a little bit, probably. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what Bo was thinking. I, I you know, because I wasn't in his head, but um, it's just fun to get together by that point. You know what I mean? Somebody paid for us to get together. I think that, I think that was, uh, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, we knew we weren't going to tear the house down. We knew, you know, it was really just a, a good platform for all three of us to be together and uh, do our thing. Yeah, man, and finish it off on, on you know, and, and sail the Texas hangman off into the sunset. Yeah, I think it was proper. Yeah, that's cool, man. You get you get that nice little. Uh, like ovation from the crowd after it's over. And, you know, that, that's a nice feeling to have, you know, I, I hate when things just disappear and fizzle out. I like when things just get a, a nice definitive end. You know what I mean? I think that's, yep, and that, that would have been it. Yeah. I just think it's, it's important that those things happen. Um, so here's something that I found interesting in my research. And please tell me if my research is incorrect. The 11th of March, 2006, there's a three way, at PPW Bash at the Beach, at Waverly Beach in Menasha, Wisconsin, <laughs> Tough Tom defeats Adrian Lynch and King Kong Bundy, which I just thought was uh, uh, an interesting tidbit. Is, is that, uh, that true? Match, that match did go down. Um, I, man, I'm trying to think of Bundy. Nice guy, by the way. A very nice big man. Uh, uh, I don't know. By then, I must have took too many shots in the head because there's a little dark spot there on that <laughs> one. Um, uh, I remember Adrian Lynch. I really don't remember King Kong Bundy being in that. I think he might have been on the show. Right. It might be a mistake. Who knows? I mean, I just, I just thought it was interesting and, and I just wanted to bring it up just to see. Um, but if you don't remember him being a part of it, then maybe that, that didn't happen. But um, I don't remember him being a part of it. I remember working Adrian Lynch uh, up at that, that, that uh, bash at the beach or whatever it was called. Yeah. 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 Okay. Fair enough. That's cool. Um, so I, I, this is, I'm getting to the tail end of your, your time in the ring here. And I just wanted you to tell me, you know, let's do a little bit of fact or fiction. Um, okay. So it's 2006. It, it appears that you wrestle as Blackjack Bennett two more times in Wisconsin. And you wrestle three more times as Tough Tom. The final match being the 9th of December, 2006 against Dinty Moore, a.k.a. the Beer City Bruiser in Grafton. Is that correct? That is correct. Did you know it was going to be your final match going into it? Uh, not really. Uh, I, but, uh, I had a feeling that uh, it was time. You know, you know what I mean? I mean, I, I didn't want to stay too long anyway. You know what I mean? A lot of guys wind up, you know, Christ, they're 60 and they can't move and they're out there. And it's like, really, guys? I mean, that's just not the kind of guy I am. You know what I mean? I'd at least like go out where, you know, I could still work when I, when I retired, I could still work. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. I, I, I think I knew it was getting to be time. I was, you know, I, uh, oh, Christ, back then I must have been, what, 38, 39. I mean, I knew it was, you know. How long, how long can you go? You know what I mean? Uh, uh, so, yeah, I think I knew it was getting to be time. It was really only Vince left. We had our tryouts and stuff already with Vince. My age wasn't getting any younger. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I had a good feeling uh, uh, that was – we actually did have one more match in, in, in 2014. Oh, really? 
Yeah, at the Sheboygan Airport here. We called it Rumble on the Runway. Yeah. And uh, Mike was in on that also. Oh, cool. So that, was, that, was, that, was really, that was really my last match. Okay. Oh, cool, man. I, I, I like learning something that I, I didn't find out in my research. That's really awesome. Um, yeah, we so- had a Cavo Guerrero was there. A uh, couple of the other guys that, that, that were free of contractual uh, obligations at that point. So, yeah, it was a good time. Uh, in front of the hometown crowd, so yeah, it was it was it was a good time to say goodbye. That's cool, bro. Um, so I mean, geez, that's that's uh, seven years ago. What do you miss most about performing? Uh, the energy of the crowd. I think you know, um, being able to work a crowd. If you're good at working a crowd, you know if you got the crowd or not. You know what I mean? And that's. And let's face it, that's what the crowd's paying for, right? So as long as people go home happy at the end of the night, that was that was really our job. At the, this whole time, the whole career was was about making people feel like they got their money's worth, right? I mean, yeah. And, and I think I think we I think we pulled that off, to be honest with you. That's cool, man. Awesome. Um, so here's here's you know the the soppy question the. <laughs> what does me Mike mean to your career? Uh, as far as on a national level, I wouldn't have had a career without Mike Moran. So, I mean, that's really, you know, um, he opened a lot of doors for me. Uh, Christ, you know, Japan, Puerto Rico. I mean, and let's face it, like in Puerto Rico, we had very good success. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah, he's, you know, he's my homeboy. He, he knows that, you know, and uh, uh, like I say, without Mike Moran, Jimmy Hart, um, um, Terry Taylor, sometimes you need a hand up and you, sometimes you need people to look out for you, you know, and them three people, I believe in my career are, are the people that, that uh, believed in me. That's awesome, bro. And, and I got to look... Mike, you, you wanted us to put you over. We're going to put you over. Okay, bro. He's over. He opened doors for you. He's opened doors for me, man. He's, he's got me the opportunity to have this fantastic conversation with you tonight. Fidel Sierra, Ricky Santana, Frankie Lancaster, so many people. And he's still working on other people for me. He's going to try. He helped, he helped get me Bam Neely, um, you know, and maybe, you know, in the future, we might get the, the chance for me to talk to Alex Porto. And uh, there's just, he's, he's always helped trying to help me out. And, uh, you know, and that's just based off me and him having a, a wonderful conversation several months ago. So yeah, that's, know, the kind of guy, that's the kind of guy Mike is, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's a giving person. He's, he's, uh, like I said, man, you just, I, I wouldn't have had a national career if, if, if it wasn't for him. Yeah. There you go, Mike. We'll put you over, bro. Okay. <laughs> uh, Sorry about the card, man. <laughs> it, it's going to get rectified. It will get rectified. Thanks to me. That's, that's my payback to him. Um, <laughs> okay. Look, we're getting right to the tail end here. We found out about your retirement and and how you felt about it, uh, how you felt about your career. Do you have any other sort of road stories? Something scary that might have happened? There's a lot of traveling that goes on. There's got to be something you could tell me <laughs> because everyone's got a scary story. I uh, I don't know if it's scary, but uh, uh, one night we're working. Uh, it's more funny than anything. We're working. Uh, uh, Ray Mysterio and I believe Eddie Guerrero. And somehow, I mean, little Ray Mysterio, he's a little guy, great guy, but a little guy. He gets thrown into our corner and he whips a elbow out and boom, hits Mike right in the right in the chicklets, right? Knocks a tooth out, knocks a bunch of them loose. So at that time, WCW would take care of you, right? So they said, all right disorderly conduct you guys have to fly to atlanta because that's where our dentist is so we fly to atlanta <laughs> mike's in the chair for some reason i don't even know why but i'm in there with him right because we were traveling together or whatever and 
you know, he's, the nurse is telling, you know, making him feel fine. Hey, you know, don't worry. We're going to give you a new grill and everything. Right. So Dennis starts grinding away at the, at the teeth he had. Right. And they, for some reason, they walk out for a minute. I don't know if they were looking at, at x-rays or whatever. And Mike looks over at me and he puts a big smile on. And I don't know if you know, but when they put uh, uh, fake teeth in, what they do is they chisel the other ones down to a point. Okay. Yeah. So he's got like four teeth up here in front that they got filed to a point. <laughs> and as they leave the room, he looks over at me, he smiles, he goes, how, how do they look, brother? <laughs> I said, they look fabulous. <laughs> And then I think uh, we found a mirror and I showed him and we both just started laughing. <laughs> fixed him up fabulous. But uh, yeah, that, that was, uh, that, that was memorable. I'll never forget that anyway. Oh, that's awesome. I never heard that bit. I, I remember him saying that, you know, thank God for Ray Mysterio elbowing me. Cause I could finally get my teeth fixed, but uh, I yeah, never heard yeah. that extra story. That's fantastic. Oh yeah. That, uh, I was sitting right there with him in the dentist's office in Atlanta. <laughs> Um, tough Tom, do you have any regrets of, of your time in the wrestling business? What's one thing that might come to mind? You know, I, I'll be honest, Carl. I, I really don't have no, I, two things I would have liked to done that I never did in the business is I would have liked to wrestle at uh, Madison square garden. And I also would have liked to, uh, wrestle at the Omni. Right. You know, them were two pretty, uh, historic buildings for wrestling. Uh, I never made them to them, but so I mean, as far as regrets, bro, I, I, I don't really have no regrets. I'm a blessed man. I, I, you know, and I, I do, I've talked with Mike on, on this too, you know, while we were out on the road, man, a lot of guys died. Mm, yeah. And there was a, a span there where the guy, they were falling like flies. And, I remember. Uh, and I just think, uh, you know, if you're getting a push and you're making really good money and everything, you know, you're, you're a little more susceptible to that kind of thing. And so, you know, who knows, I could have been the guy in the motel room, you know what I mean? So I'm glad I'm not, I, I, I think I'm blessed. I, I, you know, man, I've accomplished everything I wanted to do in this business. So you know, I still have a beautiful wife. I've been married with her for 22 years. I got a beautiful 14 year old boy. So, and we're all healthy. So that, that's really, you know, that's what it comes down to me, man. I, you know, I'm just, just loving life. Excellent, bro. That's what I love to hear the most is when I ask that question and they say, I have no regrets because I think there's, there's nothing worse really in life than, than being bitter or having regrets about this or that or the other and, and have, you know, just, just, you know, you're laying in bed at night. It's been many years since a certain moment in time in your life. And you, it, it comes to mind and it bothers you, you know, many years later. So it's really nice to see somebody uh, feel like, okay, I accomplished everything that I, that I wanted to in the business. And uh, I just think it's very important to, to feel that way. So it's nice to hear that you feel that way. Yeah. Like I say, uh, did we get to the, extent that we wanted to probably not was it a better thing in hindsight maybe you know uh we're both alive yet we're both living life we're you know we both have fabulous relationships uh I, I, no regrets bro can't have regrets and we're not bitter you know there's a lot of boys out there that are bitter you know and oh uh, i know i've had some on the show and yeah, it's just a tough conversation to get through. <laughs> it's not in my DNA. You know what I mean? I, I, I just be thankful for what you got every day. And, and, and boy, you know what? The sun's shining. That's it, bro. And if I was booking in WSW, you would have been the tag team champions. I'm telling you. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, okay. We're, we're right near the end, but I had to ask you about your bar and grill. Um, because, you know, this is what you're doing now. Please plug it. And, and tell me, you know, the experience of running your bar, you know, it must be fun. I mean, for, for me, I would love to own a bar. I mean, that, that sounds a lot of fun, you know. Tell me a little bit about it. Well, like I said, when I broke in, I was bartending. I mean, uh, uh, 
my uncle, as a, as a young child, uh, when I was 14, 15 years old, he owned a tavern. My mom worked there. Uh, I, after my mom, uh, ran the bar. So I, I've been around the bar and restaurant business pretty much all my life or all my wow. working life anyway. And uh, just seemed like the right thing to do. It's called Superior Bar and Grill. Uh, uh, fabulous food uh, without putting myself over. I, Cause I really, you know, I, I'm not a big guy. I put myself over, but uh, yeah, it's uh, clean uh food is fabulous the service is 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 second to none and uh me and my wife run it uh it's basically a harley davidson themed bar awesome yeah we uh uh run rides out of there in summer and and uh you know have broad fries and uh we call it uh Southeastern's premier Harley Davidson bar. And that's because we're right on the lake uh, here, Lake Michigan and uh, good response. Uh, we've been there uh, eight years. Wow. So, yeah. yeah it, 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 it's going good. You know, and, and just keep in mind, it's like the wrestling business. You see all the glitz and the glamor and then, you know, the fun and drinking and this and that, you know, like in the bar, but there's a lot of work that goes behind the scenes to make it that way, you know, so it's, it, it, it's a lot like the wrestling business really, you know, and, and most people don't see the grind, you know, they just see the fun stuff. Absolutely, bro. I'll tell you this. My dad, when I was about four or five years old, he ran a, 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 a hotel here in Perth um, for many years. Uh, and obviously that didn't work out, but I was a little kid running around the bar, you know, every single, I was the only kid there, you know, but I was allowed to because my dad ran the joint, but, uh, and I, I'm a massive fan of Gordon Ramsay's kitchen nightmares. So I can, I've seen so many stories of how difficult it is to, to run a successful, you know, a, like a bar and grill or a, uh, just a restaurant or, or things like that. The restaurant business is so difficult uh, to, to keep on top of, you know, because one minute you could be hot, the next thing something can go wrong. Something like COVID comes along. That must be pretty tough too, man. So, I mean, and, and again, I said the word tough again. I'm not, I'm not saying that on purpose, but <laughs> how did you get through all that? Uh, COVID was tough. Uh, you know, uh, our, governor here uh in wisconsin closed us down for 10 and a half weeks so yeah just uh that goes back to the, you know having your ducks in a row and planning for the rainy day and 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 thank god we had all those safeguards in place and we weathered the storm it looks like everybody over here anyway is getting inoculated and and i'm i'm predicting should be a big big boom when this oh, is uh, yeah. when this is all over. Yeah. See, I, I'm really lucky, Tom. I live uh, in the most isolated city in the world, Perth, Western Australia. I think we've got Honolulu, Hawaii beaten just by a, a few kilometers, but uh, we've had no community transmission in like <laughs> up 10 months, 11 months. Oh, yeah. yeah. So we don't have to walk around wearing masks or anything like that. Um, everything's pretty normal over here. Um, so well, good for you guys. Yeah. It, we're finally being in the most isolated city in the world. Uh, it, off, it, Carl, it, it was off. an advantage for once. <laughs> um, but anyway, tough Tom, what a fantastic conversation. I've had so much fun, but we've got one more segment to go. And it is called Five Second Frenzy. You have five seconds to answer each question. If you break the five seconds, it's okay because most wrestlers can't answer a question in five seconds. So, <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready, Tough Tom, from Disorderly Conduct and the Texas Hangman? Let's do it. All right. Who is your favorite wrestler, Tom? Uh, that would be probably Aaron Anderson. Awesome. Great answer. Favorite opponent over the years? Ooh. Um, I don't know. 
I, a, a couple of them, I guess, but uh, I don't know. Bret Hart always stands out just because I was very green and he still let me work. And uh, even though it was a quick, you know, this or that, it was, that always stood out to me that, that he, he was like one of the first guys that really let me, you know, work a little bit. And, and like I said, he's such a constant professional that he could tell right at the lockup if you know how to work or not. If, if you know how to work, you can tell when you lock up with a guy, <laughs> if he knows how to work or not. Excellent. Brian. Yeah. Brian. I guess Brett Hart would be one of them. Um, I don't know, man. It, 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 it was a pretty long career to be honest with you. There's a <laughs> lot of them uh, that, you know, I don't want to leave anybody out, but. So, Let's, we'll um, just leave it at Brett then and yeah, not yeah. make anyone feel left out. Brett is the number Perfect. one and everyone else is number two. And uh, Mongo can be. Uh, <laughs> uh, what was the favorite match that you ever had in your career? I know that's a hard one. Uh, uh, have hard time. Actually, this is actually, unfortunately, my favorite match ha- uh, happened on in a uh, uh, on an indie on an indie scene deal, and uh, that was also Sheboygan Falls. That's a little town that's about seven miles away from us. Um, we had took it on at that time. Uh, Russians were big heels, right? So we take on Frankie De Thumper DeFalco. He's under the hood, all right. So he's the Russian assassin, and uh, a guy named Gary. He was the uh, Colonel Petrosky, all right? So this is like one of the first times I run our town. Yeah. Place is packed, about 700 people. Uh, for that building, it was, it was huge. That was a big draw. So anyway, we beat the Russians, and here comes the tag team champions, uh, Trevor Heartbreaker, Adonis, and Dr. X. So they come in, shake our hands, turn us around, raise our hands. They take the belts and Shanghai us. We're <laughs> out, we're laying out, we're, ble- we're bleeding. And then the actual match comes like two months later. We're in a cage in the same building against Heartbreaker Adonis and Dr. X. And we win the straps in, oh, in, wow. the in front of a hometown crowd. So yeah, that would that would that, that was exciting. That's cool, man. Awesome. Um, favorite book. Um, Hooker by Lou Thez. Awesome. Uh, favorite TV show. Hmm. Um, I'd have to go old school on you. I'm going to say Dragnet. Excellent. Uh, favorite film? Uh, Dog Day Afternoon with Al Pacino. Oh, man, Al Pacino is just he's something else. Uh, favorite musical artist? Van Halen. Awesome, bro. Fucking love Van Halen so much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm assuming you like the band Accept as well, don't you? Oh, balls of the wall. Yeah, I, I, I watched a, a match of yours earlier and, and that was your theme song. So I was like, man, he likes good music. I know it. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a rock guy. That's for sure. Awesome, bro. Uh, so this is a big one considering your occupation, your favorite food. T-bone steak. Yeah, bro. I love a good steak. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whenever I'm finally over there, I do plan to come over to the US when everything calms down. I, I'm going to, without a doubt, visit your establishment. Um, do not, do not be afraid to look me up. I'm serious, bro. I, no, I trust me. I, I'm going to be I'll annoying. Be I'll, I'll end up being annoying and be like, hey, can I, can I get a few free beers, bro? <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll see what we can do, Carl. <laughs> uh so here's another one uh, favorite place to eat on the road uh Ruth Chris Ruth Chris Steakhouse got to be a steakhouse bro um yeah favorite alcoholic beverage uh besides bottled beer bud light uh usually the winter it's seagram seven and coke and in the summer it is vodka mountain dew 
<laughs> awesome, man. Awesome. Uh, the second last one, Tom, very naughty question, but <laughs> your favorite female body part. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, besides all the obvious, right? I mean. Uh, Surprise me. <laughs> uh, nap of the neck or the small of the back. Really? That's that's the first time we've had that. You know what? I dig the small of the back. Yeah, right on. When it's a sexy small of the back, you know that it leads to somewhere even nicer. That's good. <laughs> I think uh, I think me and Mike said vagina, but uh, if if, I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I got> <laughs> if I'm incorrect there, Mike, and I'm and I'm remembering wrong, I'm sorry, but I'm pretty sure that's what he said. Uh, <laughs> tough Tom. The last one for five second frenzy, your favorite curse word. Son of a bitch. Awesome, man. Yeah, that, that feels good to say when someone's being right? a son of a bitch and you go, son of a yeah, bitch. Yeah, and it, it fits in a lot of areas, man. <laughs> <laughs> Well, tough Tom, man, honestly, I, I, I've really appreciated this conversation. I've had just as much fun as I did talking to me and Mike. Um, you're a great guy and, I, and I'm so glad you have no regrets and you should be so proud of what you accomplished in, in the wrestling industry because from the most isolated city in the world, the number one disorderly conduct fan lives right here and he appreciated what you two did and I'm just so happy that your life is so blessed and you are living such a happy life. Well, Carl, first of all, thanks for having me on, man. I, I, you're a cool dude too. And uh, uh, seriously, if you ever get around here, do not be afraid to email me and I'll, I'll, I'll hook you up. I'll treat you like a king. Bro. I, w- uh, I will be there when you open the doors till you close the doors. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for appreciating us. Thanks for appreciating the work that we did. Uh, uh, yeah, man. You're very Time welcome, to say bro. Again, right? Time <laughs> to say goodbye again. <laughs> You're very welcome, bro. And thank you again for being on the show. Thank you, Carl. And thank you, everyone out there, for watching the Insider's Edge podcast here on the WCWA Network in conjunction with Blue Wire Hustle. I'm California alongside my new friend, Tough Tom, and we will see you next time. Thank you.